Good afternoon. My name is Mike Burns. I'm Executive Vice President with the American Society of Employers. And I'd like to welcome the Small Business Association of Michigan and the American Society of Employers members to a special uh, joint presentation, briefing, if you will. Uh, both our organizations are pleased to partner together to uh, continue our members' uh, education and uh, knowledge uh, in dealing with the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, today's presentation is a half hour or so briefing by Michigan's Director of COVID-19 Workplace Safety, Sean Egan, who was recently appointed to that position. In addition to this position's responsibility, Sean is also Deputy Director uh, for, uh, uh, for Labor, excuse me, at the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity, LARA for short, where he oversees a host of other employer employee focused departments, such as IOSHA, Workers Disability Compensation, and the Michigan Wage and Hour Division. All the agencies that employers look to for support and guidance, compliance speaking. In addition to uh, COVID-19, uh, to, in today's presentation, in addition to COVID-19 safety compliance, we're going to hear an update on the governor's most recent executive orders, timely, uh, as well as some information on other uh, programs that can support uh, employers during this time. With that, I will turn the program over to Sean Egan. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Mike. And, uh... Thanks so, so much for having me today. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and everybody that's tuning in today. I know that we had something uh, major happen today as it related to an executive order and face mask requirements. So um, I would like to give some of my usual remarks and we are more than happy and willing to kind of stretch this over the half hour limit and try to push up uh, some extra time so that we can kind of cover some other topics as well. Uh, one of the first things I'd like to do is just you know, kind of remind everybody um, what we're dealing with with COVID. It's important to keep in mind that we have a public health crisis that has a workplace safety impact, right? So we're trying to navigate and thread the needle with these two components. And we're trying really hard to get open and stay open. And I know that's what we're all trying to do. And we've been working with employers around the state and employer groups around the state to really talk about how we can do that. Now, there's a lot of noise because we have a 24-7 news cycle around COVID that, uh, with what's happening. But some of the science has been pretty much static from the beginning, and, and some of it's getting even stronger in favor of certain things. Uh, and that includes how it's transmitted. It's large air respiratory droplets and aerosols that we pass between each other that are the primary vehicles. So when we talk about that six, foot of, six feet of social distance, part of that's to allow gravity to get rid of that virus from getting to somebody else. And when we talk about face coverings, for sure, that's to cut down the distance that these things can travel, including both aerosols and the respiratory droplets. Now we recreate the aerosols when we breathe, when we talk, when we cough, when we sneeze, we know that. And uh, certainly higher volumes, sneezes, coughs, can push these things out even further. And the science on the mask is pretty clear that it's pulling that right back to our bodies and giving us a little bit of protection from others too, but primarily it protects others from me. It does not protect me from others, which is why you often hear us say that it's not technically PPE, even though it's referred to in a lot of cases. Um, and you know, the face coverings themselves, which I'll talk about in just a minute because of the executive order, are hugely critical for us getting open and staying open. And we know that, and I've talked with many of you and have shared that, that we really want to encourage you to require these face coverings. As we know today, that became more than just encouragement. It became an obligation to require face coverings for people indoors in the workplace as it has been, as well as uh, those indoor public spaces and outdoors if you can't maintain social distancing. Another highlight I like to make is that We've posted some information on Michigan's LEO page, our Labor and Economic Opportunity page. We have some information there on some of the best practice guidelines that many of you may have worked on. Uh, we have separated that from the COVID Workplace Safety site only because everything on our COVID Workplace Safety was created by MIOSHA. We know that a lot of employers want to know, what do I have to do? And then we want you to grab those other pieces as stretch goals. So we didn't want to start confusing the issue between the two. But I've posted some information there from ASHRAE, 
which everybody knows is the gold standard when it comes to HVAC and, and filtration systems in workplaces. And they've developed some nice COVID-19 resources that apply across a large spectrum of businesses and include some small pieces you can do to help make sure you're clearing that virus out of that indoor space. As you've seen, as we've seen, the science is really telling us and we've known that indoor has more risk than outdoor and that we need to be thinking about those types of things. So today, the governor issued Executive Order 147, right, that uh, included the requirement of businesses to deny service to those customers that are not wearing face coverings. And I know uh, that questions are flying in already on what that means. And the language of the executive order says specifically to protect employees, which as you know, means that it has a workplace safety component, customers and the public uh, from the transmission of COVID. The goal of this is to get those coverings on. That's really what we're seeing as the key. So the science tells us that, uh, and we've seen a wide range of numbers on this, but 40 to 80% of this virus is being spread by people that are asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. So they have the virus, many of those will never get sick. They have the virus and they're going to get sick, but they feel fine now. So the public needs to understand that because you feel fine does not mean you are fine. And these face coverings are to protect us all and to, to help us stay open and keep things moving forward. So as a workplace component, uh, some of the questions are like, what are, what's expected of us uh, when it comes to getting people out of our place? I will tell you that we in no way, shape or form expect or encourage or would even allow uh, employees to go out there and have some kind of physical confrontation with a customer that's refusing to comply. But employers have to make a good faith effort to do this. And what that means is, complying with the postings, requesting non-compliant customers to leave, letting them know that face masks are required, uh, contacting local authorities if they refuse to wear the face covering, never at any moment getting into a confrontation where you're, you're gonna try to push them out the door or block them from coming in the door, but it can't just be posting a sign and it's business as usual. You really have to be making an effort to keep these people out. Um, so what I would, we're, we would recommend uh, from a MIOSHA perspective and otherwise is develop a policy so your employees know exactly what they're going to do. If somebody's coming in, remind them they need to wear the mask. They refuse, ask them to leave or come back at some other time when they do have one. If they won't leave, let them know that the business may contact local authorities uh, because these masks are required. And they still won't leave, back away, have all employees maintain that six feet of social separation. Uh, and make sure that the cashiers or, or whomever's checking them out are protected. They have the barriers and are wearing their face covering. Uh, we, again, you know, if you have customers that are going to refuse to comply, it's not any different than uh, uh, shirt and shoes, right? Shirt and shoes required for entry. You ask the person to leave. If they refuse, you don't get into a conflict with them. Uh, your business grounds are private property, so you absolutely have the right to deny service and ask local authorities to have somebody removed. So um, if, if we were to get a complaint at MyOSHA to come in and check out, you know, this business isn't requiring these face coverings, these are the things we're gonna ask you. What did you do? Uh, what's your policy? What steps did you take to try to remove them? And we're not gonna come in and swing a big penalty because some bad actor customer came in and just made their way around beyond all of these things that you ask them to do, but you need to be taking those steps. Uh, beyond that, what will happen with local law, law enforcement and the other pieces on the licenses? I don't have answers for that right now, but we will certainly get those out as that develops, because I know there were some other pieces in that executive order related to licensees, uh, which Laura will work with, and uh, local law enforcement, which we'll be, we'll be working on as well. But Primarily, these are the steps that you can take to make sure that you're in compliance. Uh, and we recognize, just like all of you, that we will have some challenges, but we do not want people getting hurt, uh, but we do want you to try. And, and not just try, but try hard uh, to make this happen. And, and, and we'll, we'll struggle our way through it together, we'll learn together, and we'll, we'll make it work together. Um, we will have a Q&A at the end, so I'll stop on that for now and kind of jump back into my normal. Uh, so one of the things we've been doing over at uh, MyOSHA and Leo and now me specifically with COVID workplace safety is trying to make sure you have the resources you need 
so you know what you need to do. So we had developed a, quite a long time ago now a very good and strong website where we're posting all of our information all of the time and developed a lot of great tools for you to use that uh, can help you make sure that you're in compliance with the executive orders and otherwise. So we developed it at michigan.gov slash COVID workplace safety. And I'm sharing my screen and it put it right over uh, where I need to be. So let me just do this. Hopefully you can all see that pretty well. We have guidance created here that was created by MyOSHA posted for every industry that has been named in an executive order. And if you have not been named in an executive order, we have general industry guidelines. Now, most of you are, are familiar with this. Uh, so general industry guidelines are gonna kind of be across everybody. And when you click on your, if you're an office or a, a restaurant or bar or something, most of those general industry guidelines will be in there with the additional requirements that were placed on these types of businesses within the executive order. One of the nicest tools we have here, if you haven't had a chance to really dig into this, every business has to have an exposure control plan, right? They call it a preparedness and response plan. Myosha uses the term exposure control plan because that lines up with other regulations that, that we have. So we, they've created a sample preparedness and response plan here for low and medium risk employees. And the vast majority of workplaces in Michigan will be in that low and medium risk category. The other two categories are high and very high. Most of those deal specifically with medical facilities or medical treatments where you're dealing with known or suspected COVID patients and treating them for something where you're gonna be in their face low and medium risk are in those places where we have community transmission. We don't have a known or suspected case, but people can be carrying the virus. So the exposure control plan will run through all of the pieces of the executive order that you'll need, which includes categorizing your workers based on their risk. It'll go through some engineering and administrative controls that you can use. Engineering, of course, being like the HVAC system, physical barriers, administrative controls being staggering shifts, uh, leave policies and things like that. Uh, the health screening protocol, which I'll touch on more in a minute, uh, and some record keeping things that you need to do as it relates to uh, being able to do that contract tracing and notifying public health and things like that. So we also have uh, a bunch of videos and a bunch of fact sheets, and I clicked on the wrong button, so I'm gonna scroll real fast, sorry, um, that uh, everybody can use. So let me touch on this because I'm here, but we also developed a hotline that goes right into my OSHA, right into my OSHA staff. The wait time to get somebody to answer is about 10 seconds and you get uh, about, it, most of the calls are lasting about four to five minutes and there's no cutoff. You can talk to them for the rest of the day if you want to, but this is specifically for employees and employers that have questions about workplace safety related to COVID. We, this is a great tool and a great resource for you. And as an employer, you're going to call in and you're going to say, hey, what do I need to do on my health screening, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, if your questions are broad or need more detail or you want more help, they will get you over to the consultation team. MyOSHA has had and continues to have a great consultation, education, and training program that they will work directly with any employer, any size, any industry to help them work through how to make their workplace more safe. And that could be you know, anything from helping you develop these health screening programs or staggering shifts, whatever you need, they will help you figure that out. It's free. There are a couple of services in their program overall that they, they may charge for, but all of this stuff is primarily free and available to you as needed. Uh, that's what they're there for and that's what they do. So I encourage everybody to go to this hotline for any question that you have and they will help get you through it. We have a lot of great uh, posters and videos uh, for all industries. We have fact sheets that are a couple of pages. We have social media tools that you can use and get out on your, on your own web pages if you want to, or your Facebook and uh, uh, Twitter and all of those types of things. We put together these little sa uh, safety snapshots that you can use depending on what industry you're in, just a couple of quick tips that you can share out with your members or, or whomever that you wanna be talking to. Uh, and then, you know, we're gonna continue updating here. 
going to find, oh, there it is. Right, so we're going to continue updating this site over and over. Everything new that we do is going to be there, as well as one of the other pieces that I'm going to talk about briefly is uh, we have links there to the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. They have the Pure Michigan Business Connect program. That's a platform they've developed to help employers find PPE. It includes face coverings, hand sanitizer, physical plastic barriers, or whatever else, anything you can think of made by Michigan manufacturers. If you are a manufacturer and you've converted over to making some of those types of products, you can also get your company on the platform there. So just follow that link. And uh, I talk with them quite often. The, the manufacturers they're working with have capacity, they have stuff, and they have the ability to get you what you need for your workplace. We also have a link there to the My Symptoms app that DHHS created. It's a free app to help you comply with the health screenings. It is a, an employer goes in, signs up as an employer, and you'll get a specific employer number. You give, give that number to your employees, and then they sign up on their smartphone or desktop computer, put in your number. Uh, when you sign up, you'll have the ability to designate a contact person for these reports to go to. You can have multiple contact people. We're working on a portal right now so that your folks can log right in and see who's taken it and who's not taken it and how they came out. You get that report every day, but it's 24 hours behind right now. So the way that you stay in compliance with the health screening is on their smartphone, when they take the screening, it asks them a few questions, you know, cough, runny nose, those types of things, and they'll get a green or an orange uh, label on their on their smartphone and the green means I passed I, I don't have any symptoms related to COVID orange means that you do if they get an orange it's going to tell them uh, to not go to work contact your supervisor that's going to be whoever it'll give them whatever phone number you put in the system to contact immediately and let them know that they uh, they they have identified symptoms that are related to COVID and it also instructs them to call their medical provider and talk through what's going on because we know, like you know, some of the symptoms overlap with other stuff, right? So uh, they need to talk to their doctor to really hone in on whether or not they need to go get tested and, and those types of things. So it's a great tool. All you need to do until we get the portal open is just check a list. You know, Sean came in, he's green. You know, Mike came in, he's green. And, and you're, you're gonna be in compliance. The only caveat to all of that is that in the manufacturing space under the executive order on workplace uh, requirements, in manufacturing, there's a requirement that you have to do temperature screens. The other industries, it says, if possible and where possible, we would encourage you to try. We do not want to create congregation points, as you all know, where people are stopping and they're all, you know, within a foot of each other waiting to get their temperature screens. So you'd want to think through that. But in manufacturing, you can use the health screening app for the uh, question components, but you're still going to need to comply with that temperature screening component at the workplace. Obviously, a preference would be that folks do this before they even leave for work. That's not always feasible. Uh, some, you know, some union contracts, some is this paid time. There's some of those questions, but, you know, as soon as you can, so that uh, the first thing we always want to do is eliminate the hazard from the workplace. And these health screenings are designed to identify COVID and keep it out of the workplace. Then all of the other mitigation tools that we're using are much, much, much stronger we know that people will get sick during the day at times. We're going to run into these things. We've got to get them out of the workplace quickly, eliminate that hazard from the workplace, uh, and, and those tools will work. And uh, we believe, uh, not believe, but so in Senate Bill 690, MIOSHA received $8.55 million to provide grants to small businesses for PPE, uh, physical barriers, hand sanitizer, you know, COVID related expenses. This is for employers with 250 employees or less. So it's targeted at smaller businesses. It's up to $10,000 in a matching grant. So you have to spend the money to get the money. Um, you can't have any outstanding penalties with MIOSHA because you can't use grant dollars to pay off MIOSHA penalties, and while I know they're not related, it, you know, you, you get it. Uh, we're going to try to bucket out of the gate. We're going to try to bucket it. We have a similar program we do at MIOSHA where we normally distribute about 250000 Obviously, this is times a, a bunch. 
Uh, so it's a lot of money. So we're going to try to bucket by industry sectors based on employment. So, you know, if manufacturing is 10% of the economy, that'd be 855,000 for the first run. After about a month or so, because we want to make sure that with this vast sum of money that it kind of disperses across our economy and that doesn't get too targeted to one specific sector, just, you know, for a lot of reasons. Um, but after about a month or so, we'll see how it's shaken out. And our intention is to just kind of, if there's still money available, just put it all together and whoever's applied won't need to apply again. If we kind of hit a limit for a specific industry, we'll just kind of go from there. It works as a first come first serve type program. There will be an evaluation within MyOSHA. Um, obviously, we're not going to make a judgment call about why you need stuff. But, you know, if you have 10 employees and you request 17,000 face coverings, we're, we might have some questions for you, right? So we'll probably want to figure that stuff out. Um, we're we're going to try to launch this on Monday, July 13th, which is next week, Monday. The way we're going to do that is to place a link right on this web page that I told you about, michigan.gov COVID workplace safety. It's going to have our brochure as well as the application form. To get a grant from the state of Michigan, you have to sign up in the Sigma system for the state of Michigan. I don't know a whole lot about the Sigma system, but it's the system for any vendor in the state of Michigan. And being a grant recipient, you are considered a vendor as far as our auditing and everything else. So we do have to, you do, will have to get set up in there to uh, make sure that we can hit our audit compliance stuff. Um, and we're pretty excited about it. So again, that'll launch Monday. Uh, based on the, the executive order today, we were gonna time a press release and everything else. So our intention is to get it up on Monday still because I've been telling everybody we'll have it up on Monday, but maybe you might see a press release later in the week because uh, believe it or not, that it, some, something else took priority for now. So. Um, as you can tell, Mike, I've developed the ability to talk forever, but I'm going to go ahead and stop now because I've been talking for a while and just open up for Q&A. We got a, a couple in the chat and uh, a couple I'm in the Q&A. I'm going to turn that over to Scott to, to, to ask the questions and close then. Okay. Hi, Sean. It's Scott Lyon from SMAM. Um, a couple of things have come in in the Q&A in the chat feature. If you could just run back through quickly where folks find the app, um, the employee employer app, so they can check people in and where they go for the uh, for the grant. Those are the questions that we have to this point. And then I would uh, encourage um, additional questions from the audience if they have any through that chat feature or the Q&A feature on the uh, on the Zoom platform. Absolutely. So uh, you can get to the app itself for the health screenings in two places. You can get to it on our michigan.gov COVID workplace safety site. Scroll way down to the bottom. We are trying to shrink the page. We know it's getting long, but there's a lot of great information on there. Uh, way down at the bottom, there's a link directly for the My Symptoms app. We might have moved it to the top because we want to highlight that. Or at the michigan.gov coronavirus page, it's right in that top box there. Uh, that's right by the My Symptoms uh, uh, Safe Start plan and other pieces. And uh, so you can find it either way. Uh, you know, it's really easy to set up, really easy to use. One of the questions is when is the portal coming in? I was on a call yesterday with, uh, we're, we're working with a bunch of folks at the University of Michigan as well as DHHS on the app. Most of the lingo they say is way over my head because they're talking tech stuff, but uh, they're, they're hoping for next week or maybe the week after of getting that portal opened up so that employers can log right in and, and get real-time information. That's the goal, and they're working hard to do that. And then the grant, uh, we're going to link right to our COVID workplace safety site as well. We'll probably shoot out an announcement on the MyOSHA email list. If you're not on there, you can just go to MyOSHA and click to sign up. And then uh, We'll have a link right there on that COVID workplace safety site. It'll say, you know, my OSHA safety grants. It'll have the brochure and the application and, you know, you'll be ready to go. Okay. Thanks, Sean. Um, I'll do a shameless plug for SBAM and our efforts at this too. Um, on our website, you'll find um, a PPE section and there are some apps there. There's also um, many, many opportunities to buy masks. I think they're going to be in a little bit higher demand as of, uh, about three or four hours ago than they were yesterday. Uh, so you can get some of that PPE 
equipment that you need um, from SPAM as well and from um, the small businesses located right here in Michigan. Um, there's a question, Sean, that says, there was previously some information about PPE barrier grants available from MIOSHA. Is the grant you're referring to on Monday different than what was previously offered? Uh, so there, there might be some confusion. We haven't done any grants for stuff out of MIOSHA yet, but the MEDC had a grant program they were running for a while that included PPE and barrier grants. They were awarded a significant amount of money as well in this Senate Bill 690. Uh, we do try to coordinate the best that we can, but I don't know all of the information there. So ours is different. Uh, I believe that the grant being discussed right here was the MEDC one. And there is a connection between the new one and the old one, uh, but you'll want to check out the Michigan Economic Development Corp for that information. Okay. The next question, are the uh, are MIOSHA personnel able to come out and review and provide input on facilities to make sure we're in compliance with our reopening actions taken? Absolutely. The uh, SET team is always available for, and they can do that remotely or in person. All of our field staff with MIOSHA, like everybody's, we went remote. Uh, we never stopped investigating, but we've moved to a remote process with stay home, stay safe. All of our field folks went back into the field at the beginning of June. So they're out and about and available for, uh, for anything that you need. And I, I didn't mention, and I don't like to uh, spend too much time on it, but because we always get this question is that, MIOSHA has been from the beginning of this crisis enforcing the CDC guidelines for workplaces using the general duty clause. And I know there was some question about executive order 114 and a couple of provisions that the courts got involved with, but MIOSHA was already using the general duty clause to enforce the executive orders as well as it relates to workplace safety. Okay. Um, question is, how do you sign up for the Sigma system, is that what it was called? Um, the, to be a, the, the vendor system essentially is, is the question. I don't think it's called Sigma system, but the one that you were referring to, how do they sign up so that they make sure that they are eligible to receive the information and get those grants? Yeah, so uh, I'm not overly familiar with the Sigma system, but I, you know, I just did myself a quick uh, Google search for Sigma Michigan and it got me to, uh, the state of Michigan Sigma vendor self service and it includes a register provision on the on it and it's uh, I will just copy the link and put it in the, the chat box for you because I don't want to read this whole link and uh, hopefully that will help. That will help. Thank you. Um, and the last question we have right now is referring back to the grant program. Um, the question was about the my wish grant program. Um, and how these things connect to one another. So the, the My Wish program is completely separate. If, if the person that asked the question, we received a lot of requests through the My Wish program. We run that annually. It's about 250,000. It's up to 5,000 in that one, no big deal, but it's still for safety equipment and things like that. This 8.55 is specifically for COVID. So it's considered a separate grant program, but if you are uh, forward thinking and you know just looking for some support and you send in an application to, through the My Wish, we can't process it through there, but we're gonna move them over. Great. So you know we received, not a, not a ton, but we received some grants into the My Wish program and we would just, if you applied, we would just move them over to this new program. Great, great, thank you. Hey, well, Sean. We, go ahead, Mike. Can I, yeah, I just had a question because when we originally talked you were gonna uh, do maybe a little bit uh, on the work share programs. And I know at least we experienced a lot of questions um, and, and, and a bit of a frustration in getting the programs registered up front. Can you give us kind of an update on how that program's going now? Yeah, the program's working very well. Uh, we love it. We believe it's a great return to work tool, uh, specifically while the federal uh, additional benefit is in place through the 25th of this month of $600. The governor expanded the program so that you could cut hours by as little as 10% or as much as 60%. So four hours a week to 24 hours a week. And you're 
the way your employees would still qualify for some portion of their Michigan benefit as well as the $600 additional benefit. And that's not something we did. That's just the way the CARES Act establishes things. And all of that is federal money too. So that protects our trust fund balance that I know many employers have been paying attention to within the Michigan unemployment system. Uh, I, you know, you can set up these programs, you know, it could be company wide, you can do a classification wide, it's to help stave off layoffs. So, you know, picture an office, you have uh, all the administrative folks in the front and the operators in the back. If you only need to do it for the front, you can do that. If you need to do it for the back, you can do that if you want. Both, you can do that. You can do two separate programs. And it's a very, very good tool. It's all handled by the employer, so the employees don't have to do anything. The employer sets up a plan, submits it into the unemployment system. Um, ombudsman, there's a spot just for employers. And uh, once that's approved, you know, you set the names in, they'll set them all up for unemployment benefits. They receive whatever percentage of hours you cut of what their normal weekly benefit would have been. So if you're at the max of 362 and you cut hours by 20%, they'll get something like $78 plus the $600 per week. So it's a great tool to help companies kind of save money. We all know that as we're hoping, hoping to get open and stay open, companies didn't go from shut down to 100%, right? We're somewhere in between. And this is a tool that you can use to help pull people back into the workplace that you need to get back into the workplace, as well as save you some money on payroll and other costs while they're still being made whole or more than whole while the uh, CARES Act fund uh, additional benefit continues to run its course. Um, that it's an underutilized system. I would encourage you, even if the 600 falls off and you need to kind of cut back on hours to use it, uh, what, what happens for uh, your employees is basically they'll get a debit card in the mail. If they had a previous claim and they already set up direct deposit, it'll go to direct deposit. They can log in to switch over to direct deposit if they choose to, but the certifications and everything are handled by the employer each week to say, yes, we're still using the program and all those employees will get paid. So they don't have to do any of that themselves. Do, do you have any suggestion to, for employers who uh, were, were struggling registering the programs up front? Uh, I don't know if you heard it, but we took a few questions where it was uh, difficult to get the programs recognized uh, by uh, UIA at first. And maybe there's somebody to talk to, or maybe there's a backup uh, documentation process that they can use to, you know, let things catch up or something. Any, any suggestion there? Um, if what I, what I would encourage your members to do is probably for both SBAM and ASE, you know, if they're still having problems, send it into you, get it over to me and I'll make a connection. I think that, you know, like everything, UIA has is, is been doing very well uh, given the circumstances uh, oh, yeah. and they are playing catch up on some of these pieces. And if folks are still having issues, just let me know and we'll try to connect the dots. All right, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, one last question is actually for me, what is that, uh, what's the website for our PPE? It is sbam.org. When you're on the, the home page, <clears throat> you're going to see COVID-19 resources. You click on that, and then right below that, when you go there, you'll see a face mask to the far left side of that next page, and it's PPE uh, equipment. So that's the path that you go there. We are, um, it looks like we're out of questions and pretty much out of time. We've run over um, about five minutes, but that was sort of expected with today's executive order. I would like to Thanks, Sean, on behalf of both SBAM and ASC. Um, for those of you that have uh, attended our daily briefings, you know that Sean has made his time available to us in the past, and we thank him again for that today. If there are added questions, after the fact questions, you can submit those to SBAM at SBAM.org, and we'll get them answered um, either internally at ASC and SBAM, or if we need to, We'll forward them along to Sean and his team. Um, and last, I would just like to mention that we do have a special edition of the daily briefing today. Um, Brian Kelly has been diving deep into the new executive order 147, and that'll happen at three o'clock, just like the Monday and Thursday briefings do. Um, it'll be posted through um, Zoom, but on to our Facebook page. So 
If you want to dive a little deeper into Executive Order 147 with us, you'll have that opportunity at 3 o'clock. Sean and Mike, thanks again. I appreciate it. Have a good day, everyone. Yep, bye -bye. Thank you.